thing I can tell you about this field is until you get into patients, you really don't know what you have. You just treat it, blah, blah, but like another therapy. You'd, you'd have to be in the clinic for that. <laughs> what the hell is wrong with these people? What the hell is Teladoc doing in the number one holding? Anybody who believes that's going to happen is living in a fantasy world. That's what I think. I think companies like Bluebird are, are toast. Hey everybody, Tommy here, coming to you from the global headquarters of CRISPR Talk. Um, I have a, I'm going to be interviewing somebody Thursday evening, this coming Thursday evening, and we're going to be discussing type 1 diabetes. I think you're going to find that interview very interesting, so uh, I'll keep you all updated on that. I should be able to upload it to the channel Friday, since we're going to do it Thursday night. We'll see. It should be very interesting. I am looking forward to it. Uh, find out who my guest will be. So today, as promised, let's look at CRISPR Therapeutics, the update from their innovation day regarding their collaboration with Viasite and their attempts to treat type 1 diabetes with stem cell therapy. I've made multiple videos on this, um, so I'll put links to those in the description if you want to look at them. But basically, to recap some of the uh, clinical data that Viasite got, their previous PEC Direct data, so recall that PEC Direct is the device that allows vascularization. All right, so the patients are on immunosuppressant therapy here. This data that I'm going to show you right now, some of the um, the data that I presented in those earlier videos was not the CRISPR edited cells. Those, as you guys know, just went into trial. But to bring you up to speed on some of the data from these viacyte cells. You know, despite the measurable C-peptide observed in the responder subjects, no statistically significant measurable clinical benefit has yet been observed in this pilot study, right? That's in that video I made. Uh, here they say that the C-peptide levels were on average one one-hundredth of normal levels. Very, very tiny, if at all. Um, explants were dominated by alpha cells. Remember, alpha cells are the ones that make glucagon. Beta cells are the ones that make that produce insulin. Um, but a subset have mature beta cell phenotypes. So they had a problem in the differentiation of the cells. When 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 CRISPR and Viacide are putting these cells into the patients, they are not fully differentiated. They're what's called stage four cells. And here is just some of the numbers of the C peptide levels from some of those patients. And as you can see, there's not a lot of numbers here. So it didn't really work all that well. So you can go look at the, my older videos about that data. So now, as you know, CRISPR Therapeutics and Viasite, they have gone into trial with the first CRISPR edited cells, um, CRISPR Cas9 edited cells in November of 2021. So about six, seven months ago, eight months ago now, that's, that's when they went into trial. Um, they're testing the safety and immune evasion. All right. They also say here it's going to inform uh, 211 trial design. So when I first saw this, my first thought was this. So they just got 210 in trial. They're already working on 211. They've already got a whole bunch of data on 211. And the data that they show in the innovation data it, from the innovation data is all 211 data, not 210. So in my eyes, they already knew that 210 was going to be how do I say suboptimal, right? So they already worked on 211. So here's their plan with, with Viasite. As I said, 210's in trial now. It's got four edits for immunoevasion. 211, which is what we're going to talk about today and what they presented, has two additional edits to promote cell survival. And they expect to file um, the I, an IND, CTA, in Canada uh, the second half of this year so very soon we're in July so they got five more months and then 212 is going to be uh, mature or, or immature beta cells cells that have differentiated fully into beta cells stage six these two are stage four this is stage six this is for a portal vein injection and this is akin to what vertex is already doing in their trial Recall that this, this step, this um, deviceless approach was never in Viasite's original plan. 
Never at all. This is a fairly new thing. And if you look at my older videos from Viasite, this is never mentioned. Now it is. So um, what are they doing? Well, let's look at VCTX211, the further optimized for cell fitness. And as I said, it has 210 right here, has these four edits. Um, MHC1 knockout, uh, PDL1 knock in, uh, HLAE knock in, and thyroidoxin knock out. All right, you can see what you, you, you can read what they're for. And then VCTX211 is one that they've already done with CRISPR Cas9 that contains two additional edits something called A20, which is a knock in, it induces graft acceptance. All right, I believe in the previous paper. They saw 63% of the grafts actually took, 37% failed, and of the ones that took, very few of them actually uh, produced any meaningful amount of C-peptide. The fifth, or I'm sorry, the sixth final edit for these uh, VCTX211 is something called MAN-F, knock-in, enhances beta cell proliferation. I, I had never heard of this before. I don't read about this stuff, you know, but I, I had never heard of MAN-F. So I found this one paper right here, 2014. MANF is indispensable for the proliferation and survival of pancreatic beta cells. Wow, that sounds like it's pretty important. So my guess is, why didn't they do that before? If that paper is from 2014, why didn't they put it in VCTX210? Why'd they wait till 211? I don't know, but it's in there now. That's the point. Sounds, sounds pretty important. So let's look at 211, some of their data. Does it evade the immune system? So here's some in vitro data. We're looking at T cell proliferation. With the unedited cells, the T cells do proliferate, and you get much less proliferation with the uh, 211 cells. And T cells alone, here's how they proliferate just on themselves. So 211 looks pretty good there in an in vitro situation. Here's uh, looking at, uh, that's at the adaptive, looking at the innate natural killer attack in vitro, the unedited cells, cells killed, you were at, what, 10%? And then with the edits, you're at maybe minus 10%. I guess that means proliferation. That's why it's minus. Cells actually proliferated. And they're, they have a positive control for the natural killer cell death, and 6% uh, of those were killed. So all that looks good in vitro. Testing both the adaptive and innate 211 cells in a mouse model. Unedited, here luminescence is what we're looking at here. Unedited, and then unedited day 39, luminescence drops by about 50% or so. All right, demonstrates broad immune evasion. And then day, day 211, I'm sorry, day 211. The 211 edits on day A and 211 edits on day 39. All right. So as you can imagine, the unedited cells drop over time. The 211 cells do not drop. stays pretty consistent over time, 39 days, looking at a humanized mouse model. So all that looks pretty good too. And then here they're looking at 211 edits improve stimuli responsive insulin production. So this is what you want to see. Right, increase insulin production. So looking at C-peptide, picomolar, we're going from about 400 to about 800. I, I, I don't know why they put 270% here. You know, I mean, in my eyes, 400 to 800 is 100% increase. I don't. Will someone explain where this 270 comes from? Because I just don't get it. Um, but nonetheless, they show a real nice um, C-peptide increase, doubling with their 211 edits. Here's uh, glucose responsiveness. So in a fasted animal, um, this is mice, I think, right? Yeah. So in a fasted animal, you're at about 300 and then 30 minutes post-glucose. So then you give them glucose and the C-peptide goes up dramatically, which is, of course, what you want to see. Um, and here is preserved insulin sensitivity. I kind of had to think about this one for a little bit, ask my wife about it. Um, so when you're fasted, you're at about 300 picomolar, which is right here. And then when you give them insulin, post it one hour after you give the animals insulin, 
which is the active form, not the zymogen, I reckon, right? You give them the insulin, now the C-peptide drops, which is what you want to see, right? Because they're getting exogenous insulin. There's no need for them to keep on making insulin, hence measuring the C-peptide. That's what I think is happening here. So I wrote a note here for myself. I'm assuming these cells were transplanted into a mouse and without a device. There's no device in these, I think. And they also don't talk about glucagon levels here. Glucagon, as I said, comes from the alpha cells. Hypoglycemia promotes glucagon secretion. All they're talking about is insulin, which is great, but you know the flip side of the insulin coin is glucagon, right? Sugar goes high, make the insulin. Sugar goes too low, make the glucagon. That's the yin and yang and everything that you have to maintain. And so, hold on, yeah. And so they here's some um, histo. Look at this is in a nude rat model where they do implant the device. They even show you the device membrane right here. All right, and here they're showing vascularizations. This is an H an H and E skin stain of two eleven, and you can see the vascularization, the blood vessels forming. Um, inside the device. Um, insulin and glucagon here, they're looking at the beta and the alpha cells, um, but and they show a favorable differentiation of beta over alpha ratio of approximately two, which is a lot better than what they saw in the patients from the Viacite trial. A lot better. And then PDL1 is being maintained, retention of PDL1 expression in long term graphs, which is good. All right. Presence of cells demonstrates abundance of beta cells and avoidance of innate immune rejection in a rat. So that's good. You know, I, I always go back to the, you, you know what I'm going to say now, right? I always go back to the previous CEO of Viacite where he says, you never really know what you got until you put into a human. And he was very clear and very specific when he said, we have to do all of our modifications inside a human so we know exactly what we're doing you can test all the animals you want all the animal models that you want but until you get into a human you don't really know what you have that's why he said they do they want to do all their testing and optimizations inside a human because from what he was saying the animal models were pretty much worthless right that's my take from what he said and he was involved in this stuff on a daily basis for years this is an interesting figure. It took me a while to figure out what they were talking about here. Once again, I had to rely on my smart wife to figure things out for me, which is normally the situation. <laughs> so here they're looking at 211 reverses hyperglycemia in, in the rat model. So what they've got here is this. They've got two things going on. They've got their control animals. Let's just work on the control animals. Control animals are these gray boxes. Control animals were not given STZ. STZ is a compound, which is a beta cell toxin, as they state here. So it wipes out the beta cells, all right? You can consider it as chemo for beta cells, right? Wipes them out. So here, they do not get the STZ, but they are getting the insulin treatment. And the blood glucose is staying pretty low. And here they implant the cells, 211 cells, all right? And the blood glucose level is still staying pretty low. All right, no STZ. Now, here's the experiment, STZ. Now there's, now these animals, the green bars, get the STZ. After they get it right here, after they get it, the, the blood glucose immediately shoots up high. That makes sense, right? Because all the beta cells are being wiped out. No more um, insulin from those cells. Then they wait about four weeks. By the way, they give them insulin. That's why this bar is going back down. This bar then goes back down upon giving them insulin, and then they implant the cells, the 211 cells. As the 211 cells are developing, insulin is still present, so the, the bar can come down. The blood glucose can still come down. After the insulin treatment, which is right here, insulin treatment stops here, the bar is still going down the numbers are still going down. So the animal is being able to maintain the glucose concentration. If, how I interpret this, is that if these cells could not produce insulin and, and uh, hence C peptide, then the blood glucose should shoot back up. It should go back up here, but it didn't. It's continued to stay down. 
So that is what I believe they are trying to show in this figure. It took me a while to kind of figure that out. Um, and then they maintain glucose sensitivity. So here's fasted, 12 weeks and 16, 16 weeks, looking at the C-peptide and the serum, bicomolar. And here is 90 minutes post-glucose. Um, C-peptide shoots up, as you would expect, after 12 weeks. And then 16 weeks, I guess they gave him glucose again and waited another 90 minutes, and it still shot up. All right, so they maintain the sensitivity. Once again, there's no glucagon shown here at all. So um, here's where they stand, right? They've got their 210 that's in trial right now with the four edits on that cell. Going back to the edits too, you know, these edits, I'm not sure how these things are done. These are stem cells, so they can, I think they can make clones out of them, right? And so they now have six edits made with CRISPR-Cas9. And so my thought is, well, each of them has had, each edit has had a double-stranded break, I believe. And some have been a knock in where they recombine it in, and some have been a knockout where I guess they do the non homologous end joining to make the knockout. My point is that how many other non specific off target cuts were made, and are there any chromosomal anomalies that they're not telling us about? All right. Are there any, uh, you know, chromosomal rearrangements? I don't know. But after six edits with a CRISPR Cas9, you got to figure there's going to be some something happening there, especially since they get baseline 1% DNA translocations in their, um, you know, the CTX110 cells, CD19, right, CAR-Ts. So here's where they stand with Viasite now. Uh, as I said, 210 is in trial. Um, this trial is only supposed to last until the end of this year, um, and I'm sure they're going to follow right up with VCTX211, all right? Following after that would be 212, and that's with their fully differentiated beta cells that are naked with a portal vein injection that, vice, that uh, Vertex is doing now. So they clearly think that 210 is not the end of the road. That's why they added the extra two edits for 211, and we'll see how those respond inside a patient, inside the device. All right? So that's where we stand. You know, they're making progress. They're, they're making edits. They're making their product what they think is going to be better inside a person, but we're not going to know anything until we get data from a person. So that's it for CRISPR Therapeutics and their Viasite collaboration and their type 1 diabetes research. I believe the Vertex trial is hold on that trial is going to be lifted soon um, because as I tweeted out, the FDA only wanted some more information from Vertex. They didn't want any more specific data or experiments done per se. They just wanted more information and Vertex has responded to that. So I fully expect that trial to be lifted soon. So what do y'all think about all this stuff? I know there's a lot of type one diabetes patients out there being really hopeful about this. And like I said, we're gonna learn more about that in my upcoming interview with somebody uh, Thursday. So make sure you stay tuned for that. Thanks for watching, take care, bye-bye.